how are you, PIC and friends? We are in the second Sunday after Epipani, January 16, 2022. Today, we reflect on how we manifest God's love to others. It is the life that we show as his follower, a salt and light of the earth, and how we use the gifts he bestow on us. Let's prepare our hearts for worship. Our call to worship is from the book of Psalm, chapter 35, verse 7 to 9. How precious is your steadfast love, O God! For with you is the fountain of life. We worship you.
Let us pray. Our Heavenly Father, we are here today to give you praise, to give you thanks, to give you honor, and to put your name on high. Thank you, Lord, for this opportunity of worshiping your name. Thank you, Lord, for all the blessings that you had given to us in our everyday life. Thank you, Lord, for all the provision and the protection in our life. And as we gather this day, we ask you to clean our hearts and forgive us for all our sins. Bless each one of us, Lord, and answer all our prayer according to your divine will. Lord God, we pray to bless our pastor who's delivering your message today. Speak to us, Lord, and prepare our hearts and spirit to be changed according to your will. We ask you this in the name of our Lord and our Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Let the children voices lead us in our song of praise. Sing along people of God to his praise and glory. said, I am the light of the world. Whoever follows me will not walk in darkness, but will have the light of life.
Good afternoon, church. I'm glad to be uh, bringing the message from God's Word to you this afternoon. But before we do that, and before we start uh, meditating on God's Word, let's bow our heads in prayer. Our Father, please guide us in the study of your Word. I invoke the presence of the Holy Spirit wherever everyone may be, Lord. I pray now for open minds and ears to listen and learn. May the word I speak be those you once spoken. May the words we hear be those you want heard. May we live to your glory. Amen. The title of my message this afternoon is The Light of the World. The men of a certain Indian tribe rise early morning to perform an ancient ceremony that be they believe causes the sun to come up. They believe that if they fail to perform this ritual, they would cause the world into complete darkness. They have never dared to skip a day just to find out if what they believe was true. The risk for them was too great. It is true that without sunlight, life on this planet would quickly cease to exist. No plants would grow, the temperature would rapidly drop, and in just a short time, we would all be dead. As vital as sunlight is to our physical existence, there is a light that is even more vital to our spiritual existence. It is the light that the Apostle John describes in John chapter 1 verse 9 that says, The true light that gives light to everyone was coming into the world. This vital life-giving and sustaining light is Jesus. In our text today, we find Jesus speaking to the people and the religious establishment of his day. And our text, by the way, is found in John chapter 8, verse 12. And it reads, When Jesus spoke again to the people, he said, I am the light of the world. Whoever follows me, will never war a walk in darkness, but will have the light of light. May the Lord add his blessings to the reading of the word. The first thing we must notice from our text this afternoon is the claim. And what is the claim? I am the light of the world. This claim was made not long after the feast or the festival of tabernacles. A very spectacular part of this feast was the use of the great candelabra. There were four candelabras in all and they were filled with oil by young men who had to climb ladders that were 50 cubits high. Now, let's do a simple a computation here. A cubit is considered to be about 18 inches. 50 cubits would be around 75 feet. So if this young man had to climb 75 feet to put oil in the candelabras, the candelabras themselves must have been at least 75 feet tall. The light from these lamps was so bright that the Jewish Mishnah says 
that, and I quote, there was not a courtyard in Jerusalem that did not reflect the light, unquote. So the brightness from these candelabras was a great occasion in the city of Jerusalem. But when the feast was over, the great candelabra would no longer be shining. And the extreme darkness formed a marked contrast with the bright light that was before. It was in the darkness of this post-festival period that Jesus made his claim. He spoke not only of being a light to Jerusalem, which was all that the light of the feast could mean. He, and that is Jesus, spoke of being a light to the world. The imagery implies that the world is in darkness, that is, in the darkness of sin. And man left to themselves, cannot overcome this darkness. But Jesus claims that he can bring them the illumination needed to banish the darkness in which they live. And he can do it wherever they are in the whole wide world. The Old Testament prophesied of this light that was to come. In each of these verses, that is, in Isaiah chapter 42, verse 6, chapter 49, verse 6, and Isaiah chapter 51, verse 4, Isaiah tells about the servant of the Lord who would be a light to the Gentiles. The claim of Jesus is that he is that light. Jesus is not only the light for his followers, nor even of Israel, but he is the light of the entire world. That means he is the light for me and also the light for you. He is the light for the poor, rich, black, white, Jew, Gentile, American, Iranian, and so forth. Jesus is the light of the world, and without him, the world remains in the darkness of sin. Jesus claimed to be the light of the world. Secondly, from our text, we notice the condition. There is a condition to enjoying this light. Jesus says, Whoever follows me will never walk in darkness, but will have the light of life. And so, people are expected to react to the light. And we find that there are two basic reactions to the light. One reaction is to hide from the light. If you've ever been sitting in a darkened room for a couple hours, and then someone turns on the lights, your first reaction is to cover your eyes. The light is too much for your, for your eyes to take. You've been in the dark so long that it is hard to adjust to the brightness. In J.R.R. Tolkien's book, The Hobbit, he tells of a creature named Gollum who lived far below the surface of the earth in the caves of goblins. It hadn't always been that way. At one time, Gollum had lived above the surface just like most people but he moved underground to escape the outside world. And he lived there so long that he couldn't remember how many years it had been. 
In fact, he couldn't remember any place else ever. He became so accustomed to the darkness that it became his friend. He grew to be repulsed by the thought of light and of goodness and laughter. You know, many of us become like this creature Gollum. We live in the world of sin so long that we begin to enjoy it. We begin doing things we never would have considered before. We start to think thoughts that at one time would have shocked us. And we find that we are very comfortable in this new world where right is wrong and black is white and there is no longer any moral standard by which we must abide. And when the message of Jesus, the light of the world, comes into our lives, we cover our eyes and say, No, no, turn off the light. I can't take it. And we crawl back down into our comfortable world, a world of darkness and sin. This is one reaction to the light of Jesus. But thank God it is not the only reaction. The other reaction is to run to the light, embrace it, and make it your own. Let's return for a moment to our darkened room. We've been sitting there for a long time and someone flicked the lights, switch. Again, our immediate reaction is to cover our eyes. But instead of keeping our eyes covered, we find that our eyes are rapidly adjusting to the light. And in a short time, we find comfort in the light. It helps us, it helps us to see what we are doing. It gives us warmth. It shows us how to get from here to there. And after we've grown accustomed to the light, we find that we no longer desire the darkness. You see, when Jesus Christ, the light of the world, first comes into our lives, His light oftentimes make us reel back or hesitate because it exposes the life of sin we've been living. But if we run to the light, instead of run from the light, we will find that in a very short time, we will become accustomed to it. And not only that, we will begin to desire the light. We will not want to go a moment without enjoying the light. You know why? Because the closer we draw to the light of Jesus, the more clearly we're able to see. Jesus says that to enjoy the light, you must meet a certain condition. You must come to the light and you must follow. In first century Palestine, a teacher, or Palestine that is, a teacher like Jesus moved about from place to place and his disciples went with him. So to follow Jesus for people like his immediate disciples meant literally following him as he went from place to place. But the word is also used in the sense of following Jesus as his disciple. While there was often in Jesus' lifetime a literal physical following, the term was used from the first to mean becoming an adherent or follower of Jesus and seeking to live 
according to his teaching. Jesus said, Whoever follows me will never walk in darkness, but will have the light of life. Let me ask you this question. Have you followed Jesus? Have you accepted him as your Savior and Lord? Have you followed him by being immersed for the remission of your sins and to receive the gift of the Holy Spirit? Have you placed your membership with the local church and dedicated yourself to helping it grow? Have you become a disciple of Jesus? Have you come to the light? Is today the day you'll run from Jesus or the day you'll run to Jesus? You see, Jesus provides his light for the whole world, but the only one who are able to experience the light are those who are willing to. To follow. Have you met that condition? If not, today can be your spiritual birthday if you'll only come to the light. The claim of Jesus is to be the light of the world. The condition to experiencing the light is following Jesus. Lastly, let's consider the consequence for those who don't follow Jesus and the consequence for those who do. And that's the consequence, which is the third and last point I want to make. We live in an age of scientific enlightenment. We can pick up our telephone and talk to someone on the other side of the world. We can turn on a computer and watch it do the work of 100 men in minutes. We can receive a transplant if an organ goes bad. We can be counseled for any problem we are suffering through. The world waits at our do doorstep and runs when we call. But although we live in this scientific age, we find ourselves in one of the darkest period of history, both morally and spiritually. We have become so enlightened that we now believe it's a woman's right to have a baby murdered in her womb. According to the World Health Organization, around 73 million induced abortions take place worldwide each year. We have allowed violent crime, drug abuse, sexual perversion, broken homes, political corruption, and international terrorism to be the order of the day. And in the midst of it all, the light of Jesus Christ shines ever more brightly. But with the brightness of the light comes the two reactions we discussed earlier. Some will back away from the light and some will run to it. What are the consequences for these two sets of people? Those who reject the light will experience darkness for eternity. Let's be clear here. It is not that God does not love these people or that He doesn't want them to experience the light. They have made a choice to reject God and His way. So God, being a just God, honors their choice. We are told that those who reject Jesus 
will spend eternity in hell. Second Thessalonians 1 Thessalonians 1.9 says, They will be punished with everlasting destruction and shut out from the presence of the Lord and from the majesty of His might. In this life, even those who don't follow Jesus know something of the presence of the Lord. They are able to enjoy His creation, His provisions, His love. But in the end, if Jesus is not followed, they will be completely cut off from the presence of God. Many like to stress the agony of the fires of hell. But fire is nothing compared with the thought of being eternally separated from Almighty God. Again, Paul says in 2 Thessalonians 1.9 that those who reject Christ will be shut out from the presence of the Lord and from the majesty of His power. You see, when we reject the light of Christ, we reject God's presence. We are saying to God that we want nothing to do with Him. And if we make the decision to reject Him now, we are making an eternal decision to reject Him forever. Now for the positive side. Those who follow the light will always have the light. A certainty, a certainly as there is an eternity of separation from God for those who don't want Him, there is an eternity of communion for those who accept Him. The unity we now experience with God is but a shadow of the personal relationship we will have with Him in eternity. Jesus describes us as possessing the light of life. That is the life that comes from God, the life that is experienced by following God. It is the life that is God. If you are a Christian, you are already experiencing the light of Christ. But you are still living in a very dark world. The day is coming when there will be no more darkness for you. And all you will know is the pure light of being in the presence of God. That is something we Christians must focus, and look forward to. In closing, there was a story about a woman named Rose Crawford who had been blind for 50 years. I just can't believe it, she gasped as the doctor lifted the bandages from her eyes after her recovery from a delicate surgery in Ontario, Canada Hospital. She wept for joy when for the first time in her life, a dazzling and beautiful world of form and color greeted her eyes that now was able to see. The amazing thing about the story, however, is that 20 years of her blindness had been unnecessary. She didn't know that surgical techniques had been developed and that an operation could have restored her vision at age 30. The doctor said, she just figured there was nothing that could be done about her condition. Much of her life could have been different. As I heard about her case for the first time, some questions came to my mind. 
Why did she continue to assume that her situation was whole? was hopeless. Had no one told her about the wonderful advances in eye surgery? Then I thought of the flight of those enriched by the gospel. How many will go on living in spiritual blindness because they have not seen the light of the Savior? How many will never see the true light that has come into the world. And how many are tuned in to this live stream today that have yet to see the light and open the bandages from their eyes. For us, Let's continue to pray for those missionaries that are exposing those who have not, those, what I said earlier, the unreached by the gospel. Let's continue to pray for our neighbors who are still in the darkness. Let us pray for those who would want to run to the light that is Jesus. Thank you, Pasadena Yamlip Church. Good afternoon, and God bless us all. I will come to you in the silence I will lift you from all your fear You will hear my voice I claim you as my choice Be still and know I am here I am hopeful Strength for all the despairing, healing for the ones who dwell in shame. All the blind will see, the lame will all run free, and all.
Our sending for is from the book of First Corinthians, chapter 12, verse 4 to 6. Now, there are varieties of gifts, and there are varieties of activities. Who activates all of them in everyone? Let us pray. Lord, we thank you for this wonderful uh, afternoon of worship and uh, dedication of our lives uh, to you. We thank you, Lord, for everything that you have done to us, the local conference as well that we just, uh, uh, where we just participated with the officers, our annual reports. We thank you, Lord, for providing us wisdom. And also, as we look forward to a new future, to this year, uh, we pray that you'll provide us strength and uh, continued guidance as we share your word to other people. Thank you for the word that was delivered by Pastor Oscar. May we be able to apply this to our lives and continue with our daily, daily ministry with our family, with our friends, and with our work. We thank you, and as we end our worship service with the uh, uh, benediction may you guide us and always provide us uh, strength and wisdom from the Holy Spirit. Now to him who is able to keep you from falling, to present you without fault and with great joy, to the only God our Savior Jesus Christ be glory, majesty, dominion, and authority before all time, now and forevermore. Amen.